Okay, thank you very much, Joe. Um, good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to the Bad Group's latest Zoom meeting hosted by the Trust. Um, we've got five in the autumn winter series. And apologies here for people who might have tried to book last week and at the weekend there was a technical problem. Uh, so hopefully those who wanted to are sh showing tonight or come in tonight. Just, I'm sure most of you know, I'm chairman of Leicestershire and Rutland Badger Group. Um, uh, we are affiliated as a group to Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, uh, but we have our own membership. So if anyone, my usual plug, if anyone wishes to become a member, we're very pleased to uh, get you to join us. Uh, details are on on the website at badgergroup.org.uk. Um, Joe perhaps can put that uh, uh, on, on the screen sometime during the talk. So enough of me and the Badger Group. Um, we're very pleased tonight to welcome uh, Fran Payne. I've been at, working at Rutland Water on and off for 20 odd years and uh, Fran came along 18 years ago, I think is the right number of years. Um, as a, a newbie, I think it's fair to say, uh, she, she um, over 18 years has developed from uh, a newbie into a very, very professional uh, conservationist. Um, and she rose till fairly recently to become senior reserves officer there. Um, but to my surprise, and maybe to other people's surprise, she suddenly announced she's moving slightly away and has gone to join a month or so ago, Peterborough uh, City Council, working as a wildlife officer in biodiversity. So I think we might have another talk coming up from her on that in due course, uh, if we can persuade her. So um, I'm not gonna say any more, except we, Fran is talking, uh, well, she's a very expert grassland management manager she's done a lot with wildflower meadows at rattland water and that's what she's going to be talking about tonight so over to you fran thank you david um good evening everyone um yeah thank you david for that introduction um as david said um i worked at rattland water for, it was actually 19 years david but you were close um came along as a volunteer after I graduated from university and um, sort of moved up the ladder really, did a bit for the trust and for Anglian Water in the visitor centre education, um, assistant reserve officer for the trust then reserve officer with a huge grassland focus and then livestock care as well. Um, and then sort of earlier this year became senior reserve officer there. Um, but then, uh, yeah, six weeks ago, I started my new job with Peterborough City Council um, as a wildlife officer. So I'm sort of settling in there, learning the ropes and finding it very interesting. And um, yeah, it's all good. But um, yes, David invited me this evening to chat to you um, about the different grasslands um, at Rutland Water Nature Reserve. Um, they're more than just uh, hay meadows um, and there's very different sort of management sort of between them, depending what what we want to achieve from them. So um and apologies at the beginning I'm going to be that annoying person that's going to say next slide please all the time because we had a few technical issues so Joe is controlling the slides while I do the talking uh so uh next slide please Joe thank you um so uh the first meadow habitat or wild or grassland habitat that I'll talk to you about is sort of the traditional looking wildflower meadow um, something we all love to see sort of through June and July, um, a lovely grassland with pockets of purple and blue and yellow, um, demonstrating some beautiful wildflowers um, and hopefully associated insect life. Um, Rutland Water Nature Reserve has several of these. Um, for those of you that know the Nature Reserve um, over at Linden, there's some lovely wildflower meadows over there and Eggleton Meadows as well. And there's various others around the reserve as well. Um, relatively simple management in theory um, in these established wildflower meadows. Um, they're left to flower through the spring and the summer, and then they're cut for hay um, mid-July once everything has gone to seed. Um, and that sounds relatively simple, but there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, next slide, please, Joe. 
So um, early spring, it's always difficult trying to work out when to start talking about the cycle of a wildflower hay meadow. Um, but if I start in early spring, um, this flowering species here is meadow saxifrage. Um, it's an early flowering species. Um, and it's really important in the spring to have the grass down to a nice low level um, so that the early flowering species are all quite small and they can't compete with the tall, vigorous grasses and other broadleaf species within the wildflower meadow. So in early spring, you'll get meadow saxifrage. Um, and if you could flick to the next slide, Joe, please. And um, this is common violet. And then the next slide as well, please, Joe. Um, we'll show you some cow slips as well. So all three of these species are early flowering species. They're quite small. Um, so they really rely on that grass to be a nice low level um, before they um, before they flower. <clears throat> and to achieve that, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, we rely on sheep mainly. Uh, so at Rutland Water, there's mainly Hebridean sheep. There's, there's some other breeds in there as well, but. Hebrideans are sort of the ideal breed. Um, Hebrideans are really good. Uh, they, they're they very sort of self-reliant, really. They look after themselves. Uh, they do very well on low quality grasslands. And by low quality, I mean nutrient poor, I suppose. Um, I was doing a talk once and I said low quality grasslands at Rutland Water Nature Reserve and everyone looked at me slightly horrified. So I had to rephrase it. Obviously, they're good quality for wildlife and biodiversity, but they're low nutrient, which is really important for wildflower meadows. Um, sheep are a great tool. Uh, they've got very small mouths, so they're very selective grazers. Uh, because of that, they're, they're useful for browsing within uh, the wildflower meadows. If some of you can picture the, the wildflower meadows um, along the Eg Eggleton Reserve, they're quite small and they're surrounded some, by some really lovely hedgerows, but the hedgerows... The hedgerows are getting bigger uh, and some of the meadows are getting smaller. So the sheep grazing is really important just to nibble back the woody species that are coming in around the edges. Uh, so, yeah, the sheep, they sheep nibble, they nibble away. Um, they get the, sh the grass nice and short, very uniformly short. Um, and they do this sort of through late autumn up until the end of November. Um, and then they are removed from the meadows and then the grass is nice and short for the following spring for those early flowering species that I mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide please Joe. So uh, this is sort of uh, what we imagine to see in the summer. You see we've got some common knapweed in there, the purple sort of thistle like flower, some ladies bed straw which is the yellow flower and then I think there's a bit of yarrow in the foreground, a little white flower down the bottom there. Um, so these are some of the later flowering species. And as you can see here, the vegetation is quite is quite tall. It's quite vigorous. So those early flowering species wouldn't wouldn't have been able to compete with these. So they're, they're done now. Um, and um, there's a nice mix of grass species in there as well. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So grasses are really important in a wildflower meadow as well. It's not all about the flowers. Um, there's lots of different grass species. Some of them are better for wildflower meadows than others. And actually the grass species that we get in there, along with the broadleaf species, they tell us quite a lot about our meadow. Uh, for example, if there's too much Timothy grass or Yorkshire fog, for example, it could be indicative that the nutrient levels are a bit high within that meadow. Now, there's not necessarily anything we can do about that, depending on the management at the time, but it, it's just something to be aware of. And if you're sort of taking on management of a new meadow and you see these species, it's just it's just something to sort of note, really. Um, but yeah, grasses are really important. Um, some of our butterfly species, um, they're the food plant for caterpillars are grasses, um, such as the ringlet butterfly, meadow brown butterfly and some of the skipper species as well. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, so here are just a few species sort of associated with wildflower meadows. Uh, we've got a large skipper on the left there. Um, there's a small copper butterfly. Sorry, that's a really tiny photograph, but believe me, it's a small copper butterfly down there. Um, a four spot chaser dragonfly. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I am no orchid expert, but there's um, an orchid there as well. Um, so the dragonflies will hunt on the smaller insects with, within the wildflower meadow that are just coming off the flowers throughout the season. So really important hunting grounds for, for lots of insects. Um, just something on orchids. They're, orchids are very, 
interesting group of plants um crowd pleasers really people love orchids and that's great they're really interesting flowers if you can ever get on your stomach in a wild flower meadow and stare into an orchid you'll sort of see how how intricate they are and sort of weird shapes within them um so they are really interesting but they very much depend on the mycorrhiza within the soil um just because there's no orchids in a wild flower meadow doesn't mean it's badly managed um they're, they're quite picky they can be there one year and then not for the next five years and then they'll do a glowing display again um but they're they're really interesting plants uh next slide please jane so the last part of hay meadow management as their name suggests is the cutting of hay really important part of the process um, so I mentioned earlier that wildflower meadows like low nutrients, um, this haymaking progress process removes those nutrients from, from the soil. So the grasses and the wildflowers have put the nutrients into growing through the spring and the summer, and then we remove those nutrients when we do a hay cut. Um, this is generally done sort of after the middle of July. By that time, all, all the wildflowers and grasses have gone to seed. And then the haymaking process itself of drying and turning actually aids the seed dispersal and make sure the seeds go back down into the ground. Um, so the hay is baled and then removed from the meadow. Um, and then the sheep are used, well, as soon as the bales are off, really, the sheep can go on um, until the end of November, getting that grass nice and short, ready for the following spring. But then the livestock are removed through the winter so they don't damage the ground. Next slide, please, Joe. Uh, so the hay at Rutland Water, um, some of it is sold, but is predominantly used on the nature reserve to, to feed the livestock through the winter. This also sort of aids um, seed dispersal across the reserve. Any seeds left in the hay can go to other areas on the reserve um, and help uh, populate those areas with um, broadleaf species as well. Next slide, please, Joe. Um, so these are some of um, the Hebridean sheep at Rutland Water. Um, you can see there's some scrub in the background, so just sort of demonstrating that they are really useful tools for sort of nibbling back woody woody vegetation as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Joe. Thank you. Um, another tool, tool management method uh, within wildflower meadows, this is really important. It can be quite controversial, but um, we have to mention ragwort. Um, so ragwort is really important to wildlife. It's a really important food source for a lot of insects through the summer. Um, however, it is um, an obnoxious weed, so it is detrimental to UK agriculture and you're legally obliged to manage it um, if you're a landowner or a land manager. Um, it's highly toxic to livestock, especially when it's dead, i.e. when it's in hay. Um, so ragwort pulling within wildflower hay meadows is really important. Um, if you can't say there is no ragwort in your hay, it's absolutely worthless. So a bale that's worth nothing versus one that's worth anything from 30 to 40 pounds, it's quite an important thing to be able to do. Um, and I think you owe it to sort of like surrounding um, land owners to sort of control the ragwort as well. Um, but like I said, really important for, for insect life. So it's it's good to make sure that there's the, those other species within the grassland so they're not just reliant on the ragwort. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. And here is a slightly oddly marked cinnabar moth caterpillar um, munching on a stem of ragwort. Um, you may all be familiar with this cinnabar moth, a lovely little pink and black moth, dayfly moth that flutters about in the summer. This is its uh, its caterpillar, and they do like to feed on ragwort. Next slide, please, Joe. So um, possibly one of my favourite habitats at Rutland Water, actually, this one. Um, it's sort of lagoon edge, rough grasslands. Um, love them. Loads of broadleaf species, loads of colour. Um, you've got birds for trefoil, greater or marsh birds for trefoil, purple loose strife. You get peppermint on the shoreline. But you also get some of these really vigorous tussocky grass species, um, junkers grass and tufted hair grass, which you would never want in your hay meadow. It would never make good hay. But sort of the, the rough lagoon edge meadows, um, they're brilliant havens for insects. These, these rough tusky grasses are really sheltered. Um, so just imagine yourself, for those of you that know the reserve, I don't know, it's July time. You're sat in uh, Redshank Hyde. If you just close your eyes, and you can listen to the buzz of insects 
on that meadow in front of you. It, it's fantastic. It's brilliant. So really, really valuable habitat. Um, but no good for hay. So uh, to manage these, we use cattle. So next slide, please, Joe. Cattle, cattle are a brilliant grassland management tool. Absolutely love them. I would never be without them when managing grasslands. Um, if I had to choose between sheep and cows, cows would win every time. Don't tell the sheep I said that. Um, so cattle, they've got they've got big mouths, um, because uh, and because they've got big mouths, they are completely non-selective. They just sort of munch whatever they come across, really. And the way they move across grasslands is quite important and very different to sheep as well. Um, sheep move across in sort of long lines, really, and they create tram lines across your grassland, and they can be quite damaging. Whereas cattle, they move in a herd, but they they do spread out. Um, so they'll bruise your vegetation. So this is a really important thing for some of your more vigorous grass species, such as your juncus. Um, they'll just bruise it and just uh, just keep it back a little bit and just help you control it. Um, the way they graze as well, they rip at long grass with their tongues and they pull it out of the ground and then they create some lovely bare patches. So you get that really, really good structure within your grass and anything from bare ground, short grass, tall grass, tussocks. It's great. Absolutely brilliant. So cow, cows are really, really important. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Um, lapwing, probably a bird that most of you are familiar with, uh, breed at Rutland Water. Um, they really like areas that cattle have moved through, again, because you've got that diverse structure of grassland. Um, they've got the bare areas that they can forage in. Um, and right up to the tussocks where through the breeding season, their chick, chicks can take shelter from, from any predators as well. Um, and just flicking through the next couple of slides as well, please, Joe. It's a red shank as well. Um, and then the next slide, just some insect species as well that really like these areas. Um, a migrant hawker there on the right. Um, again, the, the, these insects, these large insects will be hunting some of the smaller insects coming off these really important areas. Um, and the Vizelle's bush cricket as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, some alternative management methods. Um, machinery, we do use it um, to manage the countryside. Um, nowhere near as good as cows. Livestock are definitely a preferred method, but sometimes mechanical methods are needed. Um, so starting with the picture on the right um, with the orange implement on the back of the tractor, that's a flail mower. Um, so this this just sort of mows the vegetation, um, leaving a fairly uniform sort of cut to it. Uh, leaves It does leave debris on, on the ground, which can damage the vegetation that's left underneath. Um, ideally, this wouldn't be used without a cow graze first. Um, the cows won't graze the vegetation once it's been cut. It, it's not palatable for them. Um, so ideally, the cows will have done done some munching first before before the machinery is used. Um, but this is useful for getting the shorelines nice and short, um, which is really important for some of the wintering wildfowl at Rutland Water. So this is a good bit of kit for that. They a tractor just gets it shorter than cows does fairly uniformly. Um, the other bit of kit on the left, really useful bit of kit. It's quite labour intensive. So this is the cut and collect machine. Um, I say labour intensive, it hasn't got a huge capacity on it and you've always got to be some, have somewhere to put the cuttings as well. So you can spend a lot of time going backwards and forwards emptying it. But it is useful, for example, if you've got a grassland where you want to get that nutrient removal but you can't do a hay cut for whatever reason, this machine is really useful. Um, but it is it is good on junkers as well. But again, um, a cow a cow graze beforehand is better just uh, just to use the tractor just that little bit less. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. So I mentioned wintering wildfowl. It would be rude not to mention widgeon when talking about Rutland Water. Um, Rutland Water being internationally important for um, wintering widgeon. Um, this little duck, well, you can see the grass it's standing on. It loves grass as short as you can get it. Um, sheep are a great tool for creating widgeon lawns. Um, cows cows are second to sheep, really, in, in this respect. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's um, that's another important species on grasslands. 
Um, actually, we have we did note over the years. Um, so the buns of Lagoon five, six, and seven. Um, the widgeon really seem to like these areas. Um, and we were sort of discussing why um, perhaps the grass species in there are softer than sort of elsewhere around the reserve. Um, but sheep graze those buns sort of all year round, get keeping the grass nice and short for the wintering widgeon. Next slide, please, Joe. Ah, she's done it. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so moving on to a, another habitat, uh, rutland water. So scrub, um, I love scrub habitat. It's it's brilliant. Some people probably wouldn't call it grassland, but in my opinion, it, it's grassland. It's it's woodland. It's hedgerows. It's it's bramble. It's everything. It's a bit of a wonder habitat, really. Um, everything sort of can live there, and you can get some rotting wood in there as well. And it's it's just a really good habitat. It's got ecotone after ecotone, which is basically just sort of edge habitats and habitat graduation, which is just really important areas for a lot of insect life, bird life, small mammal life, really, really important areas. Um, so yeah, I always claimed um, scrub management as my remit for, for grassland management. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, yeah, this is just a bit more sort of scrub habitat, really slightly different, doesn't quite have that structure as the previous slide, but even so you can sort of see the sort of um, woody species in the background there as well. Next slide, please, Joe. So cattle, again, great tool for, for managing this sort of habitat. They're sort of bash about in the woody vegetation, keeping it open, and they'll thrash about in the tussocky grass as well. And, and they'll brew some of the brambles just so they don't encroach too much. All the time, we're sort of fighting succession. So if you want it to maintain as grassland rather than woodland, you need, you need something just to contain or maintain that vegetation. And if we look at the next slide, thanks, Joe. Um, you, this area here, you can see you can see what the cattle have done. So you've got everything from bare ground and short grass to to the remaining tussocks as well. Um, so that's sort of what I mean by cattle creating a really diverse sort of sward structure um, within within the grassland, and that's really important in scrub and some of the rough grassland areas as well. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, this is a volunteer just having a just having a good old rummage. In, uh, in some of the tussocks within the grassland, um, looking at the insect life in there. Um, and I think the result the, vault, the result was fantastic, really important for, for invertebrate life. Um, and that'll be all, all year round as well. So those areas, if they're, they're not mown, which ideally some areas wouldn't be, um, really important um, places for invertebrates to, to sort of hibernate through the winter. Next slide, please, Joe. So here's just a few of the species associated with that scrub habitat that we saw um, a few pictures back. Um, I mean, we all see the red admiral on the on the brambles this time of year, a really important nectar source. And and scrub habitat is covered with brambles and berries, um, which is is really good for the butterflies. Um, reed bunting, linnets, any of the finches will be feeding on any of the seed sources within that habitat. Um, and turtle doves. I mean. I haven't heard one for a few years now, but um, scrubs are great habitat for turtle doves. They um, they require sort of four meter high mature hedgerows and scrub areas to breed in. Um, standing water as well is really important. So, you know, Rutland water, areas at Rutland water should be ideal for turtle doves. Uh, next slide, please, Joe. Briefly, sorry, this is a really boring slide. Um, I'll tell you a story. I, I put it in and then I, I couldn't delete it, so... So we just had to leave it there. So um, next slide, please, Joe. Thank you. That's much more exciting. And um, so, uh, yeah, I was just going to talk to you about a few sort of grassland enhancement projects that have occurred at Rutland Water over the last few years or may well happen over the next few years. Um, Turtle Dove project was always one that I was quite keen to do, but never really got round to it. Um, for those of you that remember, uh, turtle doves did actually used to breed at Rutland Water, both at Linden and on the Eggleton Nature Reserve near Harrier Hyde. Um, and, and the area of scrub out there is a perfect breeding habitat for them. Um, this species has hugely declined, um, suffering massively from persecution, but also habitat loss. And it's actually thought that it is feeding habitat more than anything that, 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 that is lacking in this country. Um, they're really picky about the feeding habitat that, that they can feed in. Um, 
there's a specific mix that they like, a mix of legume plants. So that'd be birds foot trefoil, red clover, sanfoin, co common vetch, sort of plants like that. Um, but they also like, um, they like big areas of bare ground within that mix. And they don't just like a big thick sward of this vegetation. They like, they like bare ground so they can land and walk around and feed. Um, so I always thought a really good project at Rutland Water to get some areas like this going with bare ground. And as you can see from the mix, it'd be great for, for in, insects as well. So that would be a really exciting project to do. And if we just have a little look at the next slide, please, Joe. Um, we can see here again that that scrub habitat um, with the four meter high hedgerows, perfect for turtle doves to breed in and, and the standing water. I mean, it's not really lacking at Rutland Water. So um, that would be a great project that may or may not happen at Rutland Water in the future. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, so a lot of you might be familiar with Sharples Meadow. Uh, this is a project very close to my heart. Um, she says that, I can't remember when I did it. I think it was back in 2016. Um, and a donation came to the trust um, for £10,000 and the brief was create good butterfly habitat. So uh, we put our heads together and uh, thought, well, great area, it's at the back of Lagoon 4, public will see it. Um, it, was, it wasn't a horrendous grassland, but it was sort of just a monoculture of annual meadow grass with a few bits of creeping thistle and stuff. So... Um, it was a huge success, um, prepared the ground, got a lovely seed mix on there, a long season meadow me mix. Um, and it's been a massive success. It's been alive with insects through the summer. Um, brown argus butterfly regularly seen there, uh, marbled white butterfly breeding on the reserve for the first time um, on, on, on this meadow. So really successful. And just a demonstration of, you know, scarify your ground and put some wildflower seed down you can even do this in your gardens sort of on, on, on your lawns you can put a little bit aside it's, it's okay to mow your lawns we all want to be able to access our gardens but you can have a bit of wildflower seed around the edges and um, and just get some more species in there next slide please joe and um, this is just an example of some of the species in in Sharples meadow um got red clover and there's grass fetchling there in the background as well um, grass fetchling, it's not massively common, but it seems to love Sharples Meadow, Meadow and the buns of Lagoon 4. They're, they're covered with it. Um, so um, that's a, a nice one to see. Um, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, marbled white butterfly on some greater knapweed. Um, like I said, they, they seem to really love this area around Lagoon 4 as well. So that's that's a huge success. Next slide, please, Joe. This picture, I, I just really like this picture. So um, you saw in the picture of Sharples Meadow, there were lots of tall um, wild carrot flower heads, the, the, the white flower that you see there. And, and this is them when they've gone to seed sort of later in the year. Um, and I just think they look like little spaceships. So I really like them. So it was just a nice picture. <laughs> uh, next slide, please, Joe. Uh, so Sharples Meadow, um, well, I guess it kind of inspired donations really. Um, a long-standing member of the trust and regular visitor to the reserve and volunteer on the reserve actually um butterfly enthusiast um wanted to create more sharples meadow areas so um donated some money to the trust to create um, a meadow area so this is at the back of back of lagoon six behind turn and pintail hides um so this machine is just i think it's called a I might be wrong. I think it's called a stone turn at this machine. Um, and it basically cuts into the ground and flips it over, um, preparing the ground for some wildflower seed to go down. Um, so hopefully in a few years time, um, there'll be some more broadleaf species in there um, with Lax Hill in the background there. And that'd be a really, really nice spot to sit and observe butterflies and dragonflies and uh, just take in some wildflower species. Next slide, please, Joe. Um, another project that um, I did at Rutland Water and um, also Sarah Bedford um, helped with this um, in subsequent years. Uh, we did some hay strewing projects, a really effective way of getting some broadleaf species in some meadows that are slightly less species rich. And it's a relatively inexpensive um, little project as well. Um, so actually, if you go to the next slide, please, Joe. So you can see here, so this field um, 
it is a wildflower meadow. Um, it is managed for hay. So the hay cut was taken off. And then um, I went in there with some volunteers and we used our uh, one of our little flail cutters nice and low and actually managed to scarify the ground so we can just expose some bare soil. Um, and then we scraped off any vegetation that was on there. So we had a good strip of nice bare ground. And then um, the next slide, please, Joe. Um, you can see here we used our cut and collect machine in one of our other wildflower rich meadows. I think this was Skylark Meadow along the Eggleton Lane, back of Lagoon 4. Um, really species rich. It's got common knapweed in there. It's got lots of different veg species as well. Um, it's got agrimony, ladies' bed straw, um, some scabious as well. So we use this as a donor meadow. So the cut and collect machine gathered it all up and then we took it back to um, the meadow where we wanted to increase species diversity. If you go to the next slide, please, Joe, um, you can see, unfortunately, all we could do is dump it in one big pile. So there was a lot of forking and a lot of raking of the vegetation. We wanted it nice and thin because you don't want it to rot because that would then just kill off any seed and then add nutrients back into the ground. So we spread it nice and thinly on, on the prepared strip. If you go to the next slide, please, Joe, we can just see how nice and thinly spread on there it is. So it just dried really nicely in the sun. Um, and then the sheep went in to do their aftermath graze and they just sort of pushed the seeds into the ground a little bit, a bit of a roller effect. Um, and it's a really cost effective way. And it was actually really successful. A couple of years later, I went and had a little look round, and there was yellow rattle in there. There was common knapweed and there was grass fetchling. So I was pretty pleased with that. And um, that's something that can just be done each year. And again, this can be done in your gardens as well. You can you can collect seed from hay meadows, um, create a bit of bare ground and do this in your gardens as well. Um, and the next slide, please, Joe, um, is actually a group of volunteers doing some seed collecting um, at Mary's Meadows uh, with a view of um, using the seed to um, increase species diversity with some of the meadows at Rutland Water as well. <clears throat> next slide, please, Joe. Uh, this is a plant. I can't believe I haven't mentioned this plant up till now. I've been talking about grasslands for the last half hour or so, and I haven't mentioned yellow rattle. It's the most important plant to get in any any kind of grassland where you want a bit of species diversity. Um, so yellow rattle is really important. Um, it parasitizes on grass, so it just suppresses your grass species. Um, so your wildflower broadleaf species can get a bit more of a chance so the grass doesn't dominate quite so much. So if you get yellow rattle, again, you can get yellow rattle in patches on your, on your lawns as well. Um, I've done it on my lawn and um, it's starting to take and it will just help suppress those vigorous grass species. So then um, a year or so later, you can get some other wildflower species in there as well. Um, this field is actually one. Uh, yeah, why not? Thanks, Joe. <laughs> um, this field is actually one. Um, it was it was very rough. It was very overgrown. A lot of woody species were taking over a lot of blackthorn, a lot of hawthorn. Um, and we actually went in there, spent a lot of time one winter clearing back a lot of the woody vegetation just to open up um, to create, hopefully, a, a wildflower meadow. And that was probably, I think that was about eight years ago. Um, and then I brought it back into sort of a proper cattle grazing regime um, and cut and collect as well, using, using the green cut and collect mower that you saw in the previous picture just to help remove the nutrients from the ground and suppress some of the vigorous grass growth. Um, and then this is a field, uh, it's got lots of pig nut came up in that field a few years ago and um, it's been covered in it for the last two or three years, I think now, uh, which is really pleasing to see. And then the little pockets of yellow rattle are coming in as well. So this meadow sort of with the right management over the next few years will be, will be, will be a really good meadow. Um, and seed collection and hay strewing can be used to improve species diversity here as well. And being sort of on the lagoon edge, again, with the correct grazing regime, this can be really useful for the widgeon as well. And that's the end. Thank you. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask away. Just, um, wait oh, sorry, I, I had a, te a technical problem there. My mute would uh, 
come off. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was saying thank you very much, uh, Fran, for a really good overview of the grasslands at Rutland Water. And I'm sure many of us will go there and have a look in the way that you've described uh, and see the different different types of grasses, which I'm sure many people don't normally recognize. Um, there aren't any questions on, on the uh, question list at the moment, but I was going to ask you particularly about Sharples Meadow, which I, I know you did in what, 2016. Um, you went for a long season there as against some of the other wildflower meadows, which were getting a hay cut in, in what, uh, July, wasn't it July or, or yeah. mm -hmm. July, early August. Um, what's the benefit of the two? One, you're getting a hay crop off it and you're getting a shorter flowering season. The other is you're getting a long flower flowering season, but then you have to use cut and collect, presumably. You can't get a hay crop off a long flowering meadow, can you? You can, if you can find someone who, who wants it. So um, a lot a lot of farmers, um, so we've only got a certain, we, <laughs> the trust that only have a certain use um, of, of hay on the reserve. Um, so it's finding someone that would want that really species rich kind of hay crop and convincing them that it is really good for, for livestock. So we we would sometimes struggle with that, to be honest with you. Um, a hay crop. So I said about it taking place sort of middle of July into August is OK. But once you leave it much later than that, into sort of September, October, as the grass starts to die back and even rot a little bit, nutrients do go back into the ground. So it is a fine balance. So the long season mix, um, it's as its name suggests, it's got flowering species right through from sort of April time all the way through till October. So by leaving it that late, that's great. There's a nectar source there for insects for a really long period of time, but you do risk some nutrients going back into the ground. So it is just a bit of a fine balance. So sometimes you, you might see on Sharples Meadows, certain areas might be might be cut and collect a little bit earlier. And that's just because some of the vigorous grass species are, are starting to dominate a bit because the nutrient levels are going up. So um, I hope that um, answered your question, <laughs> David. Yeah, it was yeah, that, that's yeah. fine. That's kind of uh, the There are, there are a couple of other questions come in. Uh, Chris Barrett. It has become more fashionable to scythe wildflower meadows. Will this be considered? <laughs> I know you're not doing it now. Um, Better ask us about if he's up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I think in, in a, a job in conservation habitat management, it's a, re it's a really fine balance. Obviously, the, the job needs doing and the habitat needs managing, but there's there's real emphasis these days on sort of um, mental well-being and being outside and, you know, we call it the the green gym um, and activities like say scything, um, really good for the environment. And it's a great sort of team team effort. So, yeah, absolutely. If um, if you've got the manpower, but obviously it's very labor intensive and it takes a long time, you know, at using a machinery to do your hay cut that can be done within a few days. Scything, I don't know. It won't take a few days. So, yeah, it, it's a balance between getting the job done and sort of um, community engagement, I suppose. Yeah, that, having said that, I've, I've seen uh, Stephen Burrows, who you know, um, I think, um, who's, I would say, professional with a scythe. He can cut quite a lot in a morning, I can assure you, when a, when he's competing with a brush cutter. I know that's <laughs> not a tractor. Um, but, yeah, it, it, and get into difficult places. Yeah, no, that's that's very true, and get sort of into hedgerow bottoms as well if you want to get those those sort of woody species. Um, no, absolutely, there's a time and a place, and I think especially if you've got a small area that's not particularly accessible with machinery, um, you know, there's definitely alternatives, um, and and a scythe could definitely be one of those things. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got an anonymous um, attendee question: Can the cattle fall in the reservoir? Is there a fence? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Pauline, but they definitely like jumping in and going for a swim. Um, <clears throat> so the cattle are really good on the lagoon edges for sort of puddling the edges. So they're actually a good tool there as well. Um, and the reservoir is a water source as well. So um, they're pretty sure footed and we have quite a graduated land to water 
um, gradient. So uh, the cows can quite happily wander in. They are very good swimmers. I've known them swim across Manton Bay. So um, have, have any ever got stuck in the mud? I've seen many humans and I, I have got, <laughs> got stuck in that thick mud on some lagoons. Have, they, have any got um, If they have got stuck, they've managed to get themselves out right. again. Um, I've, I've never found one stuck in the mud, as it were. Right. So um, no. No, they 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 know what you know. What I would always say to the volunteers when we were wor working on Lagoon Two, which is notorious for deep, thick mud, I would always say to the volunteers, "Follow the cattle tracks, and you won't get stuck in the mud." They know what they're doing, and uh, it's it's true. If you follow the cattle tracks, you you won't get stuck in the mud. Please don't quote me on that. If you get stuck in the mud, though. And and by and large, there aren't any fences at all, are there? Um, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Were you going to say something? Can, can I ask you the question about um, people who want to do little areas in their garden um, sure. for, for hay meadow type of wildflower areas? Um, they say no more may. And I think many people get disappointed in that because uh, it becomes quite rank unless they're lucky and they've got orchids and so on that shoot up. Um, what, what's the best advice to, to them in terms of? Should they uh, try and acquire some seed for, or, or some hay screwing from somewhere like a, a friendly nature reserve or friendly farmer or go and buy seed? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, they call it no mow May. I think no mow May, June and July. And if you were worried about your lawn getting a bit rank and, you know, neighbours complaining about it being messy, you can just do small patches, just a couple of, you know, metre squares. Um, and then it kind of looks a bit more intentional and managed um, as well. But yeah, definitely get some wild flower seed in there. And I would start with yellow rattle. Like I said, that will that will if yellow rattle takes it will just help to suppress because, you know, our lawns grow ever so well, don't they? They're, they're not slow, slow growing grass species in our lawns. But if you can get some yellow rattle in there just to parasitize on your grass species, um, that that's a really good starting place um and then yeah you can collect some wildflower seed from some good wildflower meadows or um naturescape over at langer which i think is in nottinghamshire um they're a yeah. really good um seed producer it's all native and it's all you have to be careful about the source that you um you get your seeds from you want them to be wild native seeds and, and, and naturescape they do all sorts they provided the seed for sharples meadow and the lagoon six meadow as well um, and you can buy little packets of seed to to put in your garden as well. But get yellow rattle in there. Um, if if it doesn't take the first year, persevere. It can be a bit funny, but once it takes, then um, that'll be your best friend to help help get your wildflower areas going in your lawns as well. As you, as you know, Fran, I, I've got a meadow area up to up to three quarters of an acre, and I I'm using yellow rattle where possible. But I do sometimes concern myself that perhaps the yellow rattle will spread into neighbouring pasture land that is uh, sheep grazed and I might get a few complaints and um, is that possible do you think I guess, I guess it is um yeah I guess it is but I don't know in my experience I, I don't think yellow rattle seed goes that far if you know what I mean it's no. quite quite a big seed it's quite a heavy seed um it doesn't really blow in the wind so um I, I I wouldn't lose sleep over it too much, David. I don't no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, right, AJ Meakin, when identifying grass species, what are the key things to look out for? What helps distinguish them? This is a challenging <laughs> question. <laughs> this is and deep, but, yeah, um, They have said thanks for really uh, for a really informative talk. Uh, so, you're welcome, AJ. <laughs> over, over to you. Try and answer that one. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on uh, grass species. Uh, you're best to talk to uh, Tim Sexton. But grasses are notoriously difficult. Um, if you can get, I don't know, if you can get to know five or six common species, such as your Coxfoot and your Crested Dog's Tail, your Yorkshire Fog, um, and then your ryegrass species, then, um, yeah, that's a good start. But I am no expert in grass identification at all. Get a hand lens got a hand lens and um and a good grass id book sit in the middle of a meadow with a flask of tea and um see if you can learn two in one day don't aim too big okay. <laughs>
Thank so you. Yes, uh, I think that's the end of the questions, but you've got some thanks coming up if you can't see them. So ask. I can't see anything. Sorry. No, right. OK. Thanks, Fran. Covered it really well. Good to see you. That's from Linda. Oh, hey, Linda. You know? Linda Clark, that is. Cool. <laughs> um, and Chris Barrett has come back saying, brilliant, Fran. Having volunteered on the reserve for several years and knowing a little about the meadows you talk has really brought it all to life and provided greater understanding. That's what we like to hear, Chris. Um, so that's wonderful. Um, yes, so we I think we've milked Fran with lots lots of time and, and so on, and she's done a really excellent job in, in bringing to life the Rutland Water and Nature Reserve from a grassland point of view. Um, so I'd like to thank her very much. You can't do an applause, so I'll do them <laughs> for you all. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to now hand over to Joe, who's just going to say goodbye and perhaps make a request for <laughs> donations for the Trust. Oh, well, thanks for everyone for watching and thanks to Fran and to David. Fran, your talk was brilliant and loved all the photographs and uh, really inspired and learned a lot about the meadows and, you know, uh, maybe start one in my own garden soon. <laughs> Be inspired. <Okay. laughs> um, and keep in touch with us and uh, don't be a stranger. <laughs> I <won't. laughs> I'll tell you all about biodiversity net gains next time, if you like. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I've before. got you marked down, Fran. <laughs> <laughs> so um i just wanted to mention that um obviously we, we put the talk on tonight for free so but if you do want to donate and perhaps you know we can make another lovely meadow and help our grasslands um in Rutland and beyond that'd be amazing so i've just put a little link in there about that so uh, yeah so it's uh good night everyone and uh thanks for joining us so thank you thank you thanks for thank bye, you everyone. bye okay bye Mm-hmm.